All right, well, Fred White's here, welcome. Uh, this is our next webinar on theatrical programming, playback, things like that. Uh, Jack will be the instructor, and uh, without further ado, I'll let him get started. Hi guys, hope you're well. Um, yeah, so as Ben said, this is um, a webinar that we've, that we've titled um, sort of command line programming and working with, with QLIS. We're not gonna be going over how to create cues in the beginning. We've covered those in, in earlier webinars. Um, but it's just some expert extra explanations of features and things that you might like to do if you're working with um, a structured cue list or a number of structured lengthy cue lists uh, in, your, in your show. As always, if you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and Ben can answer those or shout out and uh, we'll go from there. So let me just minimize the chat on, on my screen. I'll just wait for a few yeah, more. Maybe I should clarify questions that pertain to Vista right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or at least what we're talking about. Uh, if there's other things we might, it, you, that, that are loosely rel related to what we're talking about, we might hit them up too. We'll just see how we go. I'm not sure how long this webinar is going to be today, but um, we'll just go for it and see where we, see where we get to. So I'm working with a, a pre-made show file. Um, I've already got a couple of cue lists that I've created uh, down here, for example, Jack's show. And just to begin with, I'd just like to explain uh, the section that we call the super playback. The super playback is um, this section here on the right hand side. Um, this is common on all consoles that we have apart from the MV and the M1. They don't have a super playback section. Uh, but I will come back to that and show you how you can still achieve the same features shortly. So currently we're in uh, IPCG mode of the super playback, which typically is your control of features. So your actual programming. So, um, you know, you've got your intensity, pan tilt, gobo, beam filters on here. You can actually flip this round into uh, sort of mode two, which is for actual playback. And to do that, we press the menu button here and then another little menu pops up and we can change from IPCG, which is that programming mode to uh, playback mode uh, here as well. So if we go into playback mode, this is the QDIS playback section. There's nothing in here. There's no cue list in here by default. The way that you can assign cue list to this is you can drag and drop them uh, from the uh, component into here, or you could or you could have pressed the load button, which is here, and then press the select key on another playback. And the select key is the, the style, the top button on your playback. So this is a cue list over here, which is number one. If I press this select, it would load this cue list in here. Let's go back and drag in my other cue list in there. So now this is in here, it means that these controls, these transport controls are affecting this list. We've got the main uh, play button here, um, or we can skip backwards through my cues, and uh, we can skip forwards. Uh, these two here would be skip to the beginning, so the first cue, and skip to the end. So this is useful. So this working like this, we're able to use these main QList transport controls, even though we are in an open QList edit. This is the best way of playing back your show typically because you're not in the danger of accidentally editing something uh, that you might not, be, might not be used to. So in this example, we've got um, list two in the super playback. Um, but what happens when you're in the IPCG mode? Let me just jump back to that. So you press menu and press IPCG. So here, let me just release this queue list. If we edit a queue list, let's go for list number one this time. When we're editing a queue list, the super playback controls also affect this list automatically. So this is when, this is when we're in an edit of the function. So this can be useful to use these controls uh, down here. As soon as we come out of that edit and close it, this section will let go of that control. And it does, it's not controlling anything until you switch back to that um, master playback QList mode. 
A little shortcut for getting there is you can actually double press the menu button. So instead of pressing menu and playback, you can actually double press it so quickly. And that will just flip between the IPCG mode and the uh, main cue list mode uh, just here. How are we doing with the participants coming in there? But I'm getting a few pop-ups on my screen. They're coming in. Yeah, well, I'm bringing them in as they come in. Cool. Um, yeah, so it's just a little explanation about the uh, playback section on, on our consoles. As I mentioned earlier, the MV and the M1, uh, these don't have the master uh, cue list super playback section just because they're physically smaller devices. But it doesn't mean that you couldn't use the virtual console view to still give yourself that functionality. So for example, if I bring in uh, this cue list 2 to this playback by dragging and dropping, Normally, uh, we've just got the play button here by default, but if you right click in the virtual LCD, you can expand horizontally over two, three, or all the way up to five faders. It does have some default set, but if you want to change these, you could just find the button action over on the right and just drag them in. So, for example, if I drag skip forward, uh, skip to the end, uh, skip backwards, and skip to the start. We'll have that here and let's just bring pause into the top here so now even just using an ex or an mv i've still given myself the exact same functionality of what's found in the larger consoles in that super playback section here so that could be something to uh, bear in mind Another quick note on the pause functionality. Um, currently, these cues are programmed at two seconds. If I just hit play, we can see this transitioning and I can pause it. So I'll just click pause. We can see the transitions just stopped halfway through. Um, of course, if we press play again, this transition will uh, complete and then halt for the next cue. The reason I'm mentioning this is that once a cue has actually finished its transition, so it's finished its cue time here, if you click the pause button, uh, this is actually works as a play backwards. So it's going to um, go to the previous queue in that queue's time. So you're not seeing it um, snap or anything like that. So it's just a quick note that if the queue has finished its transition and you press the pause, this acts as a play backwards functionality, which some people uh, don't realize. So I just want to point that out. Any questions on that in the chat, Ben, before we move on? Nope. Nope, we're good with that. Cool. So the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, the command line in Vista 3 and how you can use that uh, to help speed up your programming. And I'm going to give you some uh, my personal favorite tips and tricks. We do have the full documentation of all of the commands and shortcuts that are available on our download section of our website. I'm not going to be going through them all in this webinar. There's just too many, but hopefully it will give you a little taste of um, what can be what can be achieved. Before we do that, I'd just like to explain some Vista behavior uh, that you might not have realized, but it is important to remember if you're using the command line because it can change what fixtures or events you're working on. So if I just demonstrate something here, I'm going to select these five spots. Um, and then if I make a different selection, for example, these lights and these lights, you can see that the selection is adding because you might want to be just selecting fixtures like I'm doing uh, right now. But what Vista does it's as soon as you change something, so let's just change the intensity. As soon as you change something, your next selection is a new one. Um, so you can then turn these lights on, and do something else. And most of the time, this works perfectly because this is the workflow that users typically want to, want to use. Uh, it's useful. But because the programmer, oh, sorry, the, uh, the GUI, should I say, and the command line work in Synergy, um, this, this section can be changing uh, quite often. The command line lives down here um, at the bottom by default. You can move it around, but by default, it's, it's always at the bottom. And before I move on, I should show you that you can also pull up a, a virtual keypad 
from here. So view a duckable window keypad, which is this guy, which you can duck around on and put wherever you like. So if you're using touch screens or you just want to click with the mouse, uh, you can actually click these uh, functions. And these are the functions that I'm going to be talking about um, in this webinar. All of these functions are also mapped to a standard keyboard that you might have connected. So hopefully I'm going to try to use this through, through this webinar. Um, if I'm going too fast though, I will speak out loud what key I'm pressing. Uh, just let us know in the chat and I can revert back to using this method if, if you wish. But personally, I find the keyboard way of doing it uh, much, much quicker. So let's just get rid of this uh, for now. Back to what I was talking about. So you can see if I select some fixtures, um, but this fixture selection is placed down here in the command line, which means I can do another command and it will affect these um, fixtures. Of course, I could have typed one uh, plus five plus uh, six and, and so on and 10 in this example to get that same selection. But of course, doing it visually is still uh, a much quicker way of, of doing that because it's pulling it down here. A key that I find myself pressing a lot is the at key, um, which is just simply the letter A or the asterisk on your keyboard. So I'm just pressing the letter A. You can see this is putting the at down here and it, the next entry that it's expecting is an intensity level. So I could type at 65% enter and that's on these fixtures um, just here. I could select these fixtures and put them at 40%. So that would be the A key. And then just the number four, we don't have to type the uh, second digit if we don't want. So this can speed up. I don't have to type four zero. I can just type four and I know that's going to be at 40%. If I did want to get the actual 4%, you'd type at 0 for, uh, 4 in there as well. If I just clear my programmer and just show you some more examples of, uh, of these. Another key or combination that I find myself pressing quite a lot is actually at at. So just double A. So if I put double A, this puts these fixtures at full. So if I'm programming, I might be working in the, in the color palette. Just by using the GUI, I know that I can select fixtures, press double A, and these fixtures are going to be turned on at full. I don't have to reach back to the all feature palette and click full or click a button on my console. I can just use it where my fingers are. So the opposite of that is the uh, Z key, directly under the at key on a QWERTY uh, keyboard. So if I want to put these values at 0%, I'm just going to press the Z key on the keyboard, which puts them at 0%. So this can be a quick way of just selecting fixtures and turning them off. This isn't clearing them. It's actually just programming a zero intensity value, just like you press this arrow uh, up here as well. So let's put these fixtures uh, on my singer, let's say, uh, up here. And let's just do something else. Put these lights up here, just copy this to here. Control C and uh, Control V. I also find myself personally using um, clear commands using the, the keyboard or the, or the command line just because I'm used to it. The clear fixture command is at enter, so just at nothing. So I'm going to press the A key again and then enter, and that would clear these all features from the selective fixtures uh, that you have. So I can repeat that process again there. If I just show you that keypad again, if you hold down the Alt key, um, this is how you would access the actual features. So intensity, position, color, gobo, beam, misc, block, one, two. And if you're working with uh, a numpad, so the, the, the keys over on the right of the keyboard, um, you can actually press those same numbers. So Alt-5 is beam. Uh, or the other way of doing it is you could press Alt and the letter B on the keyboard. And they're all pretty self-explanatory. So Alt-I is intensity, Alt-P is position, C is color, G is gobo, B is beam, misc is, is uh, miscellaneous. So they're quite easy to remember and you do get used to them uh, once you start using them. The reason I mentioned that, if I just, uh, bring these back into the uh, programming with undo is you can use that to 
filter it so I could press color at enter and clear that. Or I could decide to clear um, position uh, as well. So if we just select these lights, we can do position at enter. So it speeds my programming, programming up uh, as well. And whilst I'm talking about clearing, let's just add an effect on these ones because you can do the same, a similar thing uh, with that. So with these guys, what it would be, it would be E for effect on the keyboard, but the same command again, at enter would stop that command. So you don't have to worry about finding the commands up here. You can just uh, select the fixtures that you want to stop that effect on. Just go E, A, enter. So I find myself using that uh, quite a lot as well. So obviously with the command line, we still can select fixtures uh, using fixture ID numbers. So one through two, et cetera. The through key um, on the actual keyboard is the forward slash. So I could do one through five, enter, just to select just these fixtures uh, just here. But as I mentioned earlier, quite often in Vista, it's still easy just to select them graphically. But where I do find myself using this function is with multi-element fixtures. Let's just take a look um, at these guys just here. So if I just hold down my control key or yellow key on the keyboard, um, I can show you the element numbers. So this is fixture number 51, which has one through 19 pixels in here. And there's, a lot, there's some shortcuts that you can use to help you with this. What you can do is I could type the first pixel here, which would be 51.8 through the last fixture and the last pixel, which would be 55.19. And what that would do is quickly and easily select the outer ring on all fixtures for me. So let's just take a look at that. Oops, I've drawn there. Let's try that. So 51.8 uh, through 55.19. And that would select the outer ring on, on all of these pixels, which arguably might be quicker than me uh, clicking on each pixel ind individually. So that's just a useful tip that I could give you. And then obviously you'd normally create groups or blocking uh, f from that point there. Any questions in the chat on that, Ben? Not on that. I have some questions that I'll bring up in a bit when we go cool. get in the programming cool cool um so let's give you a couple of more uh tips that you can use uh when actually creating looks and then we'll get on to how you can use these these tips in your um actual qlist editing let's just make a, a stage look here we'll put them in this thing in reds we'll put this up in the air in yellow, and this, uh, in fact, let's do the um, guitarist here. Where's my bassist preset? Over here. Cool, so this is fiction number one, this is fiction number two, this is fiction number three. Of course, we all know that we can control C and copy and paste all of this stuff. But the command line can also do the same thing. Um, and the command for that is, you need to make a selection first, which I've just done, at fixture. Uh, the keyboard key for fixture is simply F, so at fixture, and then you can specify an ID number. So this is at fixture one, which tells it to do, tell these selected fixtures to do what fixture number one is doing. And then we can continue. At fixture number two, uh, at fixture number three, at fixture number two. So. You don't have to keep copying and pasting. It can be uh, a quick way of just getting all of that information into here. Of course, remember this looks nice because all of these lights contain reference points for the positions that I've got down here. If I just undo that, actually. Um, and you could also say, um, so let's put these lights back on the singer. And you could say at fixture free color so at fixture three color so you can filter that as well so now I've introduced that I can tell you uh, the next tip which 
using the command line is the only way uh, this is possible. So let me just play back uh, one of my cues here. Let's just take a look. I'm just looking for some fixtures that I'm using a little bit later on. Okay, so this is a good example. So we're currently in list two, uh, Q6 just here, and these lights are in a position of color in a gobo uh, like this. So without anything playing, if a director or designer or whoever, or even yourself decide that you want to put those lights in that look, you can use a similar command, but specify uh, the queue. So you could do at a list, which is W on the keyboard, at list two, Q uh, six. You can see it's populating the command line down here. If I now press enter, uh, these lights will go into that look. So I don't have to play the queue. I don't have to open the list and go in here, play it, copy and paste it. If you know the number and you know you want to take that exact look from that particular queue or scene, you can just type it, which can uh, save you save you a lot of time. So I think that's pretty much the, the um, shortcuts that I, that I just want to uh, tell you about. The next thing, of course, is, is actually how we storing queues uh, with the command line. And the command line uses basically the store part option. So if you're pressing store, which is the letter S on the keyboard, you're still using this uh, method. It's just that you don't have to use the GUI or any physical keys on the uh, console to do it. So let's take a, an example. Um, we'll just put the lights on my singer, let's say. So I'm gonna do store list three. See it down here, store list three. When I press enter, the name is already populated in this box here. So I can just type red then I'll change it. So what's happening now is the list that we're working on is already specified, which is down here, list three. We're working on this list. So I can just simply press S, store, enter, and then give it a name, yellow. Let's go for cyan, store, enter, cyan. Let's quick. Um, let's just do a rainbow as well. Of course, you can specify a queue number if you want to give it an exact number. So I could name this, sorry, give this an ID of 10 if I like. So I just press store 10 and then it will be storing ID number uh, 10, which is next in the list, just over here. Another command, it's not a command line feature, but it is a feature that I find myself using quite a lot because I'm still using the keyboard, is the spacebar access play feature. So I'm just pressing spacebar on my keyboard. Uh, this option has to be turned on in the playback options of the user preferences, it's here, which now means that I can use a spacebar to play through my list that I've just stored down here. So this is list three currently. If I want to select another list, you could just type the list in the command line. So list two, enter, now means that I want to work on list two. So if I now press spacebar, it's going to fire list two, which is these are the queues that are coming on uh, just here as well. But for now, let's uh, release that queue list and come back to list three. I'm just going to bring up my virtual console display here. I'm still using spacebar to uh, play these queues. I'm just going to drag this onto a playback over here as well. This one. This three. So you can see I'm playing this back as normal. I'm just gonna jump back to my programming view. So I'm pressing spacebar. And the queue that we're working on is, is down here. So if you wanted to change the timing of this, you could simply press T for time on the keyboard and give us a new time. So if I press zero seconds, enter, we would have just changed the time of this queue without going anywhere else in the playback view or editing it or anything else like that. The same thing goes for labeling it. If you want to change a name, we can just hit L for label and give it a, a, new, a new name. So once you know that the command line is affecting a selected list and we select a queue, then it can be really advantageous. 
this also dynamically changes when you start to edit stuff as well. So if I open up this list number two, which was Jack's show, just down here, the list changes explicitly or implicitly, should I say, to this one, because it assumes you want to work uh, in this. So you can still work in this same view, my edit view. If I want to name these, I can just use those same shortcuts. I'm just going to hit L for label. So I can give this a name. I'm going to go spacebar. We'll call this uh, cyan coming in, press spacebar. We can put this uh, raw come on. So you can see it become really quick. You don't have to go to the, um, you don't have to fiddle for this short name. We can just simply use these same same shortcuts from here. And the same goes for timings. If you want to change all of the timings of this to five seconds, you could say Q1 through uh, through six time three. If you want to change the time of all of these together. So I think that pretty much brings me to all of the end of all the things that I want to talk about in sort of the command line section. It's, it's just pointing out mainly that the explicit list is changing. Take a look what's actually in the command line. And once you know that, then you can use all of the keys for changing times, labeling them and creating new queues. Jack, can you briefly show uh, editing a queue list while it's not open for editing? So from the command line, uh, making a change to a queue list that's on a, pro on a playback. Uh, yeah, sure. Let's go back to... Um, show you with the the store windows because it's my preferred way of uh, of of doing it so let's just go for this uh, I don't know Q number three just here if you want to add in or change some some new fixtures uh, we're just gonna say to add these I could just do store three again so store three and by default that would be merging that content into this here as well. So if I press store free enter, clear my programmer, of course nothing changes because we've just updated this uh, queue. So that's using the store function again and, and specifying an already existing queue number. Or of course you could have used the update, which is you of course on the keyboard, to uh, update that list, which is just the same as pressing update up here. It's, it's completely up to you. Uh, how you want to do that, but it's just the same same thing. Personally, I like to press this store button and merge because I, I feel like I have more control over that personally. But again, that's just my personal preference of using store part to update queues rather than uh, the update function itself. Does that answer the question? Yep. Cool. So with that, let's just go back to um, my other queue list that I had before, which is uh, Jack's show, which looks like this. We talked about these features in, in other webinars, but they are really important when you're working with structured queue lists. So I'm just briefly going to touch on uh, blocking queue lists and perhaps creating alias queues uh, as well. So in my little example here, the idea that I've got in my head is that this first section of this queue list is going to be all the way up to the blackout. This is sort of section one. You can think of it as scene one in the performance or whether you've got all the way up to queue number five. In queue number five, we've then got the uh, blackout, um, which I've also programmed the move in black for my lights to be getting themselves ready in the next queue. So in queue number six, my idea here is that this is the start of the next scene in the performance. So when we block queues, um, if I just come to the timeline view to show you this next bit, here it is, let's just take a look. So the idea with blocking is that we're putting a barrier right at the start of the queue that we're actually blocking. So you can think of blocking as, uh, if I make some changes in the previous queues, you don't want them to get past this big barrier that we're creating here because 
at this point in the programming, I'm perfectly happy with how my next scene sequence looks in this example. So I don't want to uh, mess that up. So to block a queue, you can right click and press block queue. And um, that will put any of the tracked events in here, but essentially it's put a big barrier from this point here. So this is gonna look perfect, this direction. What this enables me to do is make some changes. For example, we might decide that when these uh, cyan lights come on, we also want to actually take in the cyan beams and have these um, in the up position as well. So when we play this cue, of course, it's going to fade up and those lights are going to fly up to the ceiling like this. Our cue is tracking by default. And again, we've got a full webinar explaining that. Um, but so what this means is these sign lights are going to be tracking through all of these cues. But because I blocked the uh, blackout cue, those lights are going to be automatically turned off uh, in this blackout here uh, as well. So that's just an explanation of a quick explanation of blocking being a tool that you want to what you want to work with for blocking out your sections. So I know that this section from here moving forwards when I'm programming is going to be completely okay. And of course, I might want to block the end of this section down here as well. Another tool uh, that we can use is something called Q-only editing, which means that with Q-only editing, you're making a change to a single queue that you don't want to track forwards into the into the other queues. And I'll see if I can demonstrate this again in this cyan queue list just here. Let me just think what we can do. Let's turn on the um, blinders as well. This will still be a, a good example. So with Q on the editing, if I press tools, Q on the editing, it's found in the top option here. It's red when it's on. It's also found on the uh, blue modify key just here. So this function is now on. If I make a change here, so let's turn on these uh, blinders up here. Because that tool's on, it only applies to this queue only, which means when we go ahead and press play on queue number three, those blinders are turned off because we asked them only to be in the previous queue. In terms of the actual programmed events itself, the console has actually programmed these blinders to be off uh, in this in this queue. So it's just a, so that can be a quick tool that you typically might want to be toggling on and off when you're editing uh, queue lists uh, to help you out. Does anybody want me to quickly mention moving black? We did do it in yesterday's webinar, but it is um, obviously a really important practical feature. Yeah, I'd go over that real quickly. Looks like there might be a uh, yeah, a couple questions about that. Okay, so I'm going to just program a a new uh, a new example. Um, let's start with my uh, let's go for red dimmers this time. Right? So we'll have the red dimmers here in queue number one, in queue number two. We'll bring in, uh, I don't know, some uh, yellow park hands. And in queue number three, we'll come to my spots here in yellow as well, in a gobo on my band position. All right, let's go for this so that you might see that a little bit clearer on here as well. So what happens when we play Q number three is you'll see these lights moving from their default position, which is open white straight down and off. So we actually see that movement fading in and coming onto my singer just here. Sometimes that's desirable, sometimes it's not. So we can use the autumn, sorry, the moving black feature if you want to not see that move. And the way that we can do that briefly is right click the queue that the movement's contained in, which is Q number three press mark Q, control M, and then basically we can just hit OK, and that will put that movement into the queue before. So let's just play back the queue list. Uh, oops, queue number one, queue number two, and queue number three, which is now these lights just fading up in position just here. 
you may also want to use moving black on um, non-moving fixtures as well. Q2 would have been an example of that. These part kinds are also changing from their default value, which is white, to yellow. So when we play Q number two yellow, you can see in Wizard League these are fading from white to yellow. So we could use a moving black on this as well to make sure it's yellow in the queue before. So if I show you this thing now, these lights are going to be uh, fading up in yellow. Wizard League's not very good at showing that. Or well, perhaps I didn't have the right fixture selected. Let's take a look. And it's fading up in, in yellow. I didn't have my selection correct before. So that's a brief introduction to moving black and what it's useful in practical based queue lists. Um, as mentioned, we did do a full webinar on this uh, yesterday. So if you do want to uh, jump back to the YouTube channel and see the full explanation of that, then um, that's on there. We're good on the chat there, Ben? Yeah, Stephen had brought up a question earlier about the the move in black queue uh, with the block queue. Uh, yeah. Yeah, how they the, the the blackout happened before the move in black, and just want to make sure that that didn't affect it. Uh, yeah, I actually I made the move in black before I did the block out the blackouts, and the two are completely um, separate. Yeah, that's why I. I mean, it was my choice to put this movement as additional queue. I could have put the movement in this same blackout queue as well, but um, it was my personal choice just to put that there. Just because you, it's easier to program and just put the separation of it personally, I think, but that's up to you. So this movement here is just um, these moving lights getting into position on this band position just here. Uh, but yeah, no, the block wouldn't normally mess that up. It was just my choice to insert a additional queue. Okay, that's a good one. So moving away from editing queue lists, um, two windows that we haven't talked about at all in, in previous webinars, which is one of the primary reasons I wanted to do this one, is the playback screen. So the playback screen shows me all of the queue lists that I've stored in the console. Currently I have four. And with this, we're actually seeing this uh, progress down here. So if you're playing back your show, I'm using the space bar again here, we can see that we're playing in these queues and what everything's looking like in these just here. So it can be can be useful. Um, you can actually play queues directly by pressing the actual play button. So you can think of this as almost a jump feature. If you want to go from the sign up to the yellow magenta queue and skip that, then you can just press play and we'll then move to the yellow magenta queue. This button here is the skip. So we can just skip to the end state of this particular queue when you're pressing it. Another little tip that I can give you is when we're skipping forwards and backwards queues, we're actually doing this over lifetime. So if I give this uh, five seconds and skip to the yellow magenta queue, this will actually fade in over five seconds in this example, as opposed to the programmed uh, three seconds here uh, as well. So that's just a little tip about skipping forwards and backwards. It actually uses lifetime to do that. Of course, you can type notes in this section if you want to um, uh, type notes. It's completely up to you what, you what you want to do with that from there. In terms of the column headers itself, um, they're found here at the top. And if you right click, you can choose to uh, hide certain columns if you don't want to see them. For example, you don't want to see the notes section at all. You can hide or show stuff uh, from here. Other filters that are available within this playback view are found on the view drop down. And they're down here towards the bottom. A personal one that I like to use uh, quite often is only show me the active queue list. So if we click this, it's only going to show me the queue list that are currently playing back, which can help me um, know what's actually playing and, and, what's, and what's not. 
We've also got a few other um, toggles here. I'm just going to turn a follow on select for now. I'll come back to that in a second. The first one I want to explain is follow on go. So if I'm pressing play on this, it's following the go press. If I jump back to uh, another cue list now and press go on something else, we should see that this has changed to this list because the go was the last action on this list. So therefore what it's showing me in this right hand column um, has been um, changed just follow and go. So again, if I go back to play my blackout queue here, it's changed to queue list two jack show. But if we just wait a second, that should, <laughs> should change uh, automatically as well. Let's take a look for a minute. What I'm expecting here is for this auto follow here just happening in one second's time. So if you're pressing play on these, we'll, we'll see this switching back over time. So just something to be aware of. Sometimes it's actually useful, sometimes it's not. I just wanted to explain what the follow on go is. It literally means change the queue list that you're looking at in this view. Every time you press go on the queue list, it will change to that list. Another one is follow on select, um, which simply means it's following the queue that you explicitly select using these keys. So if I select list one, it will be showing me list one. If you select list two, it's showing you list two, which of course you could also type in the command line uh, list, list one to select it, uh, enter, and it will just show you this as well. So that's a uh, useful one from there. The only other tool here is uh, auto scroll, which uh, means if you've got a huge long list, let's just edit this too for a second. Just remember I didn't talk about um, aliasing queues. So what auto scroll would be is when we're playing this queue list through here. It means basically when it gets to the to get to the end, is it auto scrolling? down for you. That's that's all that means. It's keeping the currently playing queue somewhere in the middle of the screen so you can really see uh, what you're doing. So the playback window has its own dedicated window up here on the top left of the screen. But do remember you can add this as a customizable uh, floating window as well. To do that you press view add doc dockable window and then come down to the playback window. Um, some people like to pop that somewhere so that when they're playing back a show, um, they can still be viewing what's going on in the, uh, in the fixed choose of view or whatever else they've got going on and still know exactly what queue is happening uh, in here. If you're working in a single screen, of course, you can have multiple views and screens in Vista as well same uh, toggle controls at the top here as well. So another window is the um, fixture output window. Let me just play uh, one of these cues for a second. Gone too far, I'm just gonna go back to uh, this cue just here. So in the output, uh, screen. Typically by default we see um, all of the fixtures and, and what they're doing. So if we take a look at the, uh, let's find those floor washes. These guys we can see what color information they're in, all of this stuff um, coming from here. So in, we can see at a glance what each fixture is doing. This is open shutter, it's in the up preset, it's in this slot on the zooms at 50%. If you right click, there are some other tools to be able to just show you certain things. One that I find really useful when programming um, is source mode. So if we click source mode, it actually tells you where the events actually programmed. So just to remind you, we're currently in Q4 playing to stage of list two, but in the source mode, it's showing you where the position is coming from. Where is the source? Well, the position is coming from, it's actually programmed in the second queue of this list. 
as is the color. So we know it's tracking forwards. So if you're ever in doubt about where a certain event's coming from, you can come here to the output view and click on source mode. And then you can find out exactly where that information is coming from. So you could then, okay, we need to adjust that. So we know we need to go back to the source and um, actually change the, the contents of, of that from here. Other functions that are available are just ways of filtering this out. By default, it's everything in there, um, but you could tell it just to show you the active fixtures only in these queues or to follow your fixture selection. If you come down here to the bottom, it's not too clear, but you have actually got a number of tabs and there's one by default. If you want to add a new tab, you just right click and press add view. Um, and then you've got a second view, of course, you can then say this is the source mode view or, or something else, it's completely up to you. The only other type of view that's available here is something that we call intensity view, which just gives you um, a little icon with all the fixture numbers and their percentage values in numeric form. To be honest, arguably in Vista 3, this feature has been superseded by the fact that we can actually show the intensity output values directly from within the managed layout properties. But I just want to explain that um, as we go. Are any questions on the output screen, sir? No, not on the output screens. Uh, when you flip through your layouts and, and we saw the front 3D view, that, that of course, caused all kinds <laughs> of interesting ideas. So uh, we will have a, a, a webinar on layouts later. Um, yeah, sure. I think, is it next week? Yeah. I don't remember exactly when it is, but um, yeah, we will be doing a full uh, webinar on layouts and we'll talk about background images, which all this is, but it's a real nice way of, uh, of working. time is it? I have a few minutes left if there's nothing more. So, so one thing I would like to see uh, <clears throat> on an EX when you're in playback mode, how can we sh uh, show more cues on the screen using the expand? Oh, I see. Uh, That's where I'm going at. <laughs> so, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the EX uh, does have uh, an expand key here, which is basically pushes the virtual view down slightly to show, you can see it's expanding. It's just giving you more cues to uh, take a look at here, which will be useful if you're using the uh, virtual console interface and you have that dot uh, somewhere else on your screen. We can see that. We can see more information down here, which is... Uh, which is handy. Another feature that uh, I said I'd talk about for programming queue lists is the um, copying and creating an alias queue. I'm just going to briefly introduce it in this webinar. We have done a dedicated webinar on all of the options of copying and pasting and aliasing. So feel free to go and watch that one. But let's just do a quick example here again. Let's put the lights on the uh, singer inside. Let's go for the band. I use the singer all the time. And then we'll come back to my app position. So I've got two cues. Um, here it is. Of course, we can copy cues normally by just dragging and dropping. So we'd have cue number one, cue number two, and cue number three again. But what I wanted to show you was the option to alias a queue. And the way that we do that is we hold down the red modifier key or shift and drag and drop. And when we do this, we get the paste special option and we can select an alias queue is. And why this is useful for theatrical based programming or structured queue lists where you've got repetitive looks is that we only have to update one of the sources. So these are linked to each other. We see the alias uh, link tab at the top. But the idea is that I only have to update one of these and it will automatically update all of the same cues of that same, same alias. We don't have to um, keep repeating ourselves again and again and again. We just update one of them and it, it's going to update all of the other ones of the uh, same type. So it's, it's, a useful, uh, it's a useful feature. Just do some more programming here. 
I'm just purposely doing some bad programming because the last thing that I probably want to talk about is a way to clean up the programmed events in your queue list. So I've just programmed these lights at full here and also the band position here. All 20 of these events don't need to be here in terms of tracking because this should track forwards from Q4 and the position should also track forwards from Q4 into Q number six as well. So the last tool that I think I'm going to talk about is just the option to remove Q redundant queue list events, which will delete any event that doesn't need to be in your programming. So if we press this, it will delete uh, 30 events from this um, queue list that don't need to be there for the actual stage look. So that can help just tidy things up, slim down your show files and make troubleshooting and programming uh, much easier. I've got any last uh, questions for that. Sorry, I'm going through some stuff here. Uh, commands, as for, for commands, I think we're going to have to cover that in another webinar. Uh, there's, there's a question about macros being made of a series of commands that are executed by with a single button. Um, yeah, absolutely. You, you can do that. Um, to be honest, I think, I think we'll be talking about that in next Thursday's um, webinar. So just like we did today when we're kind of talking about ideas and, and tips and tricks for working with almost a single main structure queue list. Next Thursday's webinar is going to be about um, more sort of working live with multiple queue lists. Uh, an example of that is if you're doing sort of musical based work when you want to transition from one list which is one song onto a second list which is another song and so on, how you can get that automatic and looking smooth without fixtures flying off and doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah, today is sort of geared for the, uh, the single list, the actual style where you're basically running everything off of one list. Uh, there are lots of other ways of doing it, so we'll, we'll definitely expand on that on, on the future webinars. Uh, in the show list, is there a way to resize the queue name once you import an input a name? Do you, uh, mean, do you mean these names here at the top? So if I do Jack's amazing uh, queue name, do you mean this space here? Yes. Not from there. So if I wanted to do that, to be honest, I'd probably just press L on the keyboard and press label, and then we'll be able to label it uh, something else up here. I can't type, by the way. It's a common thing throughout my training. Or just jump back to uh, this view here and uh, name it uh, in here as well. This this can be renamed. Uh, yeah. So it, yeah, in the playback screen, you can expand it to show you the whole thing. Um, however, I mean, you can't resize them on the playbacks of the console. So if you're looking at it on the on the EX console display, there's only a little bit of room. In fact, I I would argue that even even some of the smaller ones, like on list three where it says on Q3 where it says new name, that is all actually a little bit too much to have on a Q list name. So. I would I would probably recommend trying to keep your queueless names as simple as possible, uh, or abbreviations or whatnot. Both uh, both queueless names and uh, queue names themselves. Can you label a number of queues in one command? Uh. Yes, you can. Um, so I could, I'd still do that with the command line. I do Q1 through uh, six label Jack. Or another way to do it, if you don't want to do the command line is um, click and hold shift in the uh, playback view, right click and press edit name. So something else. I'd have to say the command line is far quicker than any other way of labeling multiple queues at once. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look through here. Uh, to, to do. You could, again, you're still working a hybrid style like I've done here. You can hold down shift, select queues, and then just hit L, label, um, something else. Or you can right click, I think, as well, change the name, label somewhere here. See, I'm just looking through some of the other questions. If there's anything else that was brought up, 
let's see here. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If anyone else has any questions, now it's time to bring them up. I'm just checking to see if there's anything else here. Uh, how can I know how many fixtures, how many queues fixture two is active? I believe that's something that's on our list of enhancements. If it's what I'm thinking. I think uh, so. it's, it's a fairly common request. We are aware of it. Um, there's not like a, there's not a report function as such. Um, the best way to do that at the minute would be to just literally use the timeline filter function and just see exactly where that fixture is used in which queues visually. Um, but there's no automatic report of yeah. that at the moment. Can you can you go back and do that again, but slow down a little bit? <laughs> so <laughs> let's say you want to take a look at what queues these are in. We're in the timeline, I'm clicking my view filter selection down here. And um, just there by visually go. looking at this, I'm, I'm, I'm able to see which queues they're used in. And I guess something else that might be useful is, let me just program some other stuff. This is a really bad example, but. So this isn't a preset. This is a preset. If I just program some positions in here, uh, as well. These are not presets. These are presets. You could go to um, the advanced filter in the timeline, come down to create a uh, custom uh, view filter, and you could change any of this stuff. For example, you could say you want to um, get the console to show you all fixtures that are not a preset, for example. So this would then filter to just show me everything that's not a preset because you might want to then go in and tidy up those queues and actually oh crap, crap I didn't realize that we need to update the reference point for these so you can then create presets for uh, this new position straight in there so they can help you tidy up your programming from there that's probably a whole nother rabbit hole we could get down on on the filtering I would probably say that's a good thing for uh, uh, experimenting with on your own too because it's one of those situations where you need to have a, a, a actual situation to use it in. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so examine Q2. Yeah, it's the queries is is basically what you're asking, and that is definitely something that's on the list. Okay. Well, I don't see there are any other questions. Uh, you know, last call for questions. If anyone else has anything. Uh, with what we've been doing. And uh, if not, we'll wrap this thing up. Thanks guys, hope you found it useful and uh, hopefully see you uh, next Wednesday and Thursday.